Uh, so today we'll be talking about Quaker history. And one thing I've learned, um, unfortunately, after I finished most of my studies, was that history is really not about dates and battles. Um, but history is stories about people. Um, sometimes stories about individuals, sometimes stories about groups of people. It is, history is a narrative of the human experience. And Quaker history is composed of stories about our people. And so Quaker history really, these are our stories. And when I view it that way, I find it utterly fascinating, utterly engrossing to try and understand how friends in the past heard, understood, and acted on the spirit. Um, and do my best to use that as one of the things that informs me in my life. And I also try and keep in mind that history is not something that happened in the past and is finished. Um, but what happened in the past carries forward to the present and into the future. And in fact, each of our stories, everybody who's in this workshop, is part of this unfolding, ongoing narrative of Quaker history. What I'm gonna to try to do today is give you very broad brush of some of the major developments um, in, in the history of the Religious Society of Friends. I will be mentioning names that you might find familiar. I won't have time to go into detail about pretty much any of them, which is a shame because they're, they're truly fascinating people, many of them. Um, but to give you a sense of basically to give you a framework that as you learn more, um, you can fit together the pieces a little more easily. So Quakerism started in the mid 1600s in England. Um, the context here was that about a hundred years earlier, uh, Henry VIII had broken with the Catholic Church and established the Church of England, Anglican or, or Episcopal Church. Um, by the beginning of the 1600s, uh, the printing press, that technology was, was reasonably widespread, and the Bible had been translated into English. So for the first time, uh, people could read the Bible by themselves, as opposed to having someone who was both literate and knew Latin um, interpret it for them. And this, this launched the Reformation in Europe and, um, and in England. Um, the largest uh, group of English people who questioned the kind of unitary authority of the Anglican Church were the Puritans. Um, in those days, church and state were very tightly intertwined. Um, in fact, sometimes it was hard to tell the difference between the government and, and the religious establishment. So any challenge to religious authority was automatically a challenge to political authority as well. Um, this caused a great deal of tension in England that eventually broke into open civil war. Um, the Puritans against, uh, against the king, against the royal forces. Um, ultimately, the Puritan army under Oliver Cromwell won uh, and executed Charles I. This is the environment into which George Fox was born. Uh, George Fox was uh, the son of a weaver. He was trained as a shoemaker, as a cobbler. He, by all accounts, was a quiet and studious young man. 
who had a lot of questions about religion. And so he started by asking the elders in his village, the, the minister, um, and he couldn't get good answers. He couldn't get answers that satisfied him. So he started traveling more widely, again, speaking to religious leaders, to learned people, um, to respected women and men um, around England, trying to understand God, scripture, and the role he should play in his life. Um, he did this for a number of years um, and did not receive satisfaction until one day he was by himself and he had the opening that um, I, I showed you on the first day uh, where he had this revelation that there is one, even Christ Jesus, who can speak to thy condition. Um, so the, the epiphany that he did not need a book, he did not need human authorities to communicate with the divine, he could do it himself and so could everybody else. This fired George Fox up with a wild enthusiasm. Um, this was, he saw this as complete liberation and was excited to share this epiphany with anyone who would listen. And so he traveled broadly, especially in Northern England, but also to London um, and, and some of the other cities, um, preaching about this new understanding that he had reached. And George apparently was an extremely good speaker, um, a very charismatic man, and there was a population that was hungry for something like this. So this movement of what we can think of as early Quakers caught on um, like wildfire. Uh, they're, they're, Quakers called the process of what we would probably call conversion, they called it convincement. And so they were large, George Fox would preach in front of large crowds in marketplaces. He would interrupt church services. He would go anywhere people were gathered and preach and the number of convinced friends grew and grew. Um, there was then a reaction against that on the part of the authorities. Um, this was coupled with the fact that Charles II um, returned from France defeated the Puritan armies and reinstated the monarchy in England with himself as king. So the Puritans were overthrown. Um, and anything that, that smacked of Puritanism um, was, was suspect. Um, the Quakers, even though they were rather different, um, fell in that same category and were seen as subversive challenges to the reinstated monarchy. Um, a number of, and, and since this movement was growing so rapidly, um, they were seen as a real threat. And so were suppressed rather brutally um, by the restored monarchy. There were laws passed explicitly um, to prevent Quakers from meeting for worship, for meeting in groups, um, for preaching, etc. George Fox himself and many of the early friends spent large amounts of time in prison, which in those days were, were very, pretty awful places. Um, and in fact, many early friends died in prison. Um, somewhere in this time, uh, George Fox was preaching and in the audience was a woman named Margaret Fell. Margaret Fell was the wife of a magistrate, later, um, later to become a judge, Judge Fell. Um, they were uh, 
they, they, they were wealthy. Um, they owned a great deal of landowners. Um, they had a very nice manor, which was named Swarthmore Hall. And when Margaret Fox heard, when, when Margaret Fell heard George Fox speak, she was convinced on the spot. And she opened Swarthmore Hall to Fox, to the other Quakers. Um, George Fox was not the only friend who was traveling around England. Um, many of the early friends became traveling ministers and traveled throughout England. Um, and uh, they all found at least a temporary home at Swarthmore Hall. So it kind of became the center. It was the one place where traveling ministers could find one another. In addition, Margaret Fell kept a extensive correspondence with uh, the friends, friends all over England, um, both the, the ones who were settled and the ones who were traveling. And through this network of, of letters, kept everyone in touch with one another. So the way I think about this is that George Fox was the inspired charismatic founder of Quakerism. Margaret Fell, equally inspired, but in a different way, was an organizational genius. And what she did was take a movement and help transform it into the Religious Society of Friends into an actual organization. Um, so, it's, so it's Margaret Fell who developed a lot of the organizational structures that differentiated Quakers from a number of other dissident religious groups um, that, were, that were seeking and agitating at the same time. Quakers, the early friends traveled not only in England, but in the continent, or on, on the continent, the European continent, um, as well as to the British colonies in the New World, Barbados and, uh, and North America. <coughs> One of my favorites um, was a woman named Mary Fisher, who ended up trapped. She, Mary Fisher had a leading she felt that her task was to speak to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So she traveled, she, she started as a, uh, as a housemaid, as a servant in, in a manor house. Um, she ended up traveling to Turkey and obtained an audience with the emperor and, and spoke to him for an hour, hour and a half, and apparently had a very, a very good conversation. Um, but this is the kind of thing that early friends were doing. Um, early friends established themselves in the American colonies. Um, especially in Rhode Island, New Jersey, um, and the Carolinas. They had presence in other colonies as well. And so all of this was taking place between about 1650 and 1680, about 30 years. Um, in 1682, there was another significant development, um, a man by the name of William Penn, um, kind of, it's not so much he burst onto the scene because he came onto the scene earlier than that. Um, he was an aristocrat. Uh, he was friends with George Fox. He was expelled from Oxford. Um, he was a convinced Quaker. He spent time in the Tower of London. Um, <coughs> so he was clearly a, a, um, a significant figure in, in early friends society. Um, his father was an admiral, and Admiral Penn had lent a great deal of money to Charles II when Charles II was financing the army that then crossed the channel, came back to England, and overthrew the Puritans. Uh, admiral Penn died, passed away, um, and to repay the debt, 
that the crown owned the Penn family, um, Charles II granted William Penn a grant of a rather large chunk of land in North America, uh, Pennsylvania. So this became William Penn's colony. He saw this opportunity as what he called the holy experiment. Um, he gathered colonists, um, brought them to the New World, and established what um, he intended to be a Quaker colony. Um, one of the things that's well worth looking at is the, the Constitution of, of Pennsylvania, which is known as the First Frame of Government. Is really a very remarkable document on governance, informed by both the spiritual experience, but also the political experience of Quakers in England and the oppression that they suffered. So it includes things like freedom of religion, um, open trials, uh, things that became the basis for the United States um, Constitution and especially Bill of Rights um, years later. Uh, unfortunately, William Penn's sons, um, who inherited the colony, um, had converted away from Quakerism. They did not take their father's principles as seriously as one might like. Um, so the holy experiment, per se, kind of fizzled out. But there were still a large number of friends um, in, in the colony, in Pennsylvania, um, including in the assembly, you know, in, in, in the uh, colonial government. That was also true in Rhode Island, um, that, that Quakers were uh, politically very well represented. Um, there were some substantial challenges during this time. Um, the first one being in Rhode Island with what is known as King Philip's War, which was a revolt is probably not the right word, but it was the Native American tribes of New England fighting back against their against the, the colonialists. Um, the Quaker peace testimony was strongly challenged by this, um, and especially those friends who were in the state legislature um, were very torn with some advocating that European settlers defend themselves and others um, working very hard to find a peaceful solution. Um, And so that was kind of the first 50 years um, from say 1650 to 1700. Um, expansion into the new world, um, rapid expansion originally in England and then pretty brutal suppression um, with a lot of friends in jail, a lot of friends having died. Uh, the next century, the 1700s, um, are known as the quietest period in Quaker history. Um, partially based on kind of the lessons they had learned in England, um, Quakers largely withdrew from public life. Um, they saw, started seeing themselves not as a, as a proselytizing, outgoing, um, missionary movement, um, but as a separate people um, who were distinct and did not feel the call to participate broadly in, in society. Um, it was a time of deep spirituality among friends. Um, if one reads journals, of friends from the 1700s, both, both in England and the United States. Um, the spiritual nature of their lives is, is extraordinary. It's very impressive. Um, it is, I find, quite inspiring. 
Um, but they were, they were withdrawn, um, which is not to say that nothing happened. Um, in particular, there are two friends who are known from the quietist period. One is Benjamin Lay, um, the other is John Woolman. Um, and both were early and fierce abolitionists. Um, the American colonies had slavery and Quakers, there were Quakers, especially in the South, but not only in the South, who owned enslaved people. Um, Benjamin Lay and, uh, and John Woolman spoke out against this in very different ways. Um, Lay was an in-your-face agitator. Um, and eventually was so abrasive um, and challenged so many of the important friends that he was read out of his meeting. So read out means disowned, kicked out of the Religious Society of Friends. John Woolman was no less persistent. Um, his style was different. Uh, he traveled widely, especially in the American South. He spoke with uh, Quakers who owned enslaved peoples. Um, and he found a way to connect. And so he was, he was very persuasive in a quiet, accessible, uh, like I say, no less persistent, but maybe more approachable way. Um, I should have mentioned that actually in the 1600s, in 1688, um, the first written opposition to the institution of slavery um, came out of Germantown Friends meeting. And Germantown Friends, Germantown Friends, Germantown back then was a town outside of Philadelphia. Um, it is now embedded in the metropolitan area of Philadelphia. It was actually a separate place back then. Um, and Germantown Friends meeting sent a letter to Philadelphia yearly meeting saying, Slavery is incompatible with our faith, and friends need to stop. Um, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting kind of tabled it. Um, they didn't really do a whole lot with this epistle. But, but the idea that slavery was incompatible with, with friends' faith starts way back in, in 1688. Um, Benjamin Lay, John Woolman, and others carried it into the 1700s. Um, there were two additional wars during the 1700s that again challenged friends. Um, one was what we know as the French and Indian War um, of the 1750s, and of course the, uh, the War of Independence. Um, 1776 and, and on. Um, again, there were friends who, the, the French and Indian War, friends mostly opposed, and those few friends who were left in um, uh, colonial government um, pretty much resigned um, because they were not willing to fund militias um, to fight against the French. For, for what was seen as a, a war between colonial powers um, that they didn't feel really affected them. Um, and that was kind of the final withdrawal of friends from the, from the public sphere. Um, the War of Independence, um, there were friends who uh, took up arms to defend the British. There were friends who took up arms um, with the Patriots. And there were many friends who refused to take up arms, but it was another um, very challenging time um, for Quakers in America. The 1800s, so the 19th century, um, demonstrate kind of the reemergence of, of Quakers back into the public sphere as well as uh, some very significant schisms, divisions within the Religious Society of Friends that are with us today. So by, let's see, 
1784, so 100 years after the Germantown letter, in 1784, the last Quaker yearly meeting um, banned any member of the Religious Society of Friends from owning slaves. So it took 100 years, but the Religious Society of Friends came around to recognizing that, that owning enslaved peoples was, was incompatible with God's will. Um, one of the consequences of that decision was that, especially in the Carolinas, um, the farmers found that plantations were not economically feasible without slave labor. Um, they could not compete economically um, with the other plantations. And this began a migration of friends, especially from the South, into what was then considered the West. Um, so we're talking Ohio and uh, Indiana in particular, and that, that was known as the West. But in the East, especially in Philadelphia, which was really the center of, of, of Quakerism um, in the New World, was that some of the families who had been there for a long time had established themselves and become quite wealthy. Um, it was said of friends that they came to do good and they did very well indeed. Um, and so there were quite a few Quakers among high society in Philadelphia. Um, and they were greatly, uh, greatly influenced by what was happening in England. Um, in the early 1800s, 1820s or so, um, there was a revival movement in England led by John Wesley, who ultimately um, founded the Methodist Church. Um, and so there were evangelical preachers um, and, and kind of the great revival. Um, some of these preachers came to the United States. Um, they were welcomed especially in the upper echelons of, of society, um, including in Philadelphia. And they had influence on a number of these important Philadelphia Quaker families. And the first split within the Religious Society of Friends came between largely rural Quakers um, who wanted to keep to the, the old ways, unprogrammed meeting, um, no ministers, no, no designated special people. And what was seen as a dilution of, of those principles um, by the Wesleyan movement and um, especially in Philadelphia but in other parts of New England. Um, there was all, I mean, there were class issues, there were social issues, there were a lot of things that, that connected into this. Um, but ultimately, uh, Philadelphia yearly meeting and most other yearly meetings in the United States ended up separating between the Hicksite faction, named after Elias Hicks, um, who was a, a friend from Long Island and represented uh, the unprogrammed direct experience and what were known as the Orthodox Friends, um, who were becoming more scripturally oriented um, and more integrated into the rest of Protestant American life. So that was, that was the first big split. Um, liberal Friends, um, we come out of that, the Hicksite side. We, we really are Hicksite friends or what has evolved out of the, the Hicksite branch. Um, about 20 years later, there was another split um, where some of the Orthodox friends broke off. Um, they were known as the Wilburites after Wilbur. Um, it was the Wilburites and the Gurneyites, um, named after two charismatic uh, preachers. 
Um, the Wilburites felt that the, the Orthodox strait had moved too far away from, from, the, from their roots. And so they split off and they became conservative friends. Conservative friends are still around. Um, the big difference between liberal and conservative friends is they're both unprogrammed. Um, conservative friends are explicitly Christ-centered and liberal friends are more theologically diverse. So there was the, um, the Gurneyite strain, which became Friends United Meeting. Um, it was originally called Five Years Meeting, then it was called uh, Friends United Meeting, um, as, as, and still is today. There were the Hicksite liberal friends, there were the Wilburite conservative friends. Um, in the, the early 1900s, um, Friends United Meeting suffered another split and evangelical friends broke off. And so there are now four major branches of, of the Religious Society Friends. Um, liberal, conservative, Friends United Meeting, and evangelical friends. So kind of the, the major axes here are whether meetings are programmed or unprogrammed. Um, the program, the ones I call pastoral here, and whether they're Christ-centered and theologically diverse. So you can kind of see where liberal friends fit, where conservative friends, and then both Friends United Meeting and Evangelical Friends International are both pastoral and uh, Christ-centered. Of course, also during the 1800s, um, abolition was very big deal. Um, Quakers played a larger role than their numbers would indicate in the abolition movement, um, including Levi Coffin, who was one of the, the conductors of the Underground Railroad, um, and a woman named Lucretia Mott. Uh, Lucretia Mott was a, originally from Nantucket, born into an established Quaker family, the Coffins. Um, she married James Mott, moved to Philadelphia, became a pillar of the Quaker society. Um, an extraordinary woman. On the one hand, she kept a household, nine children, I think she had. Um, she gave dinner parties. You know, she was part of Pennsylvania society. At the same time, she was a leader in the abolition movement and in the feminist movement. Um, in fact, on some level, it was one that led to the other. Um, she traveled to England for the World Anti-Slavery Convention. Um, since she was a woman, she was enough allowed to speak. This annoyed her terribly. And among other things, when she returned to the United States, she and a couple of buddies um, organized the Seneca Falls uh, Women's Convention, which is seen as kind of the birth of an organized feminist women's movement in the United States. Um, so Quakers were, again, very much part of social and political life um, during the, the 1800s, um, as well as splitting into, into various factions. Um, the 20th century, the 1900s, um, I think of as a period, again, of great expansion. Um, and sincere efforts to reconnect. Uh, Friends United meeting in 1902 or 1903 sent a few missionaries to West Africa. And they found a home in Western province of Kenya um, and convinced the Luya tribe, who are predominant in, in, in Western Kenya, um, to, to take on Quakerism. The Friends United Meeting 
um, style of Quakerism. Um, today, there are as many Quakers in Kenya, or almost as many Quakers in Kenya as in the rest of the world combined. Um, a little later, evangelical friends sent missionaries to Latin America and convinced um, quite a few people, especially in Bolivia. So there is a very large concentration of evangelical friends in Bolivia. Um, one thing that was very different in the 20th century from earlier is that the majority of friends were no longer people who were born into the faith, um, but were friends who were convinced, who had started off someplace else and found the Religious Society of Friends. Um, among other things, Baltimore Yearly Meeting and other yearly meetings um, abolished the notion of birthright friends. Used to be if you were born into a Quaker family, you were part of the Religious Society of Friends. Um, we no longer do that. Um, regardless of birth, you go through a clearness process and uh, approval by the meeting. Many Quakers were draft resistors during the First and Second World Wars. Um, friends were heavily involved in the civil rights movement and in a sequence of anti-war movements, uh, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. One of the notable friends of the second half of the 20th century was Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was a labor organizer. He was a civil rights organizer. He was an out gay man. He spent two years in jail for refusing to register for the draft during World War II. He spent three weeks on a chain gang in North Carolina for civil rights work. He was a very close associate of Dr. Martin Luther King. He introduced Dr. King to Gandhian nonviolence and was a key advisor regarding the tactics of civil disobedience. Um, he worked with Dr. King on the Montgomery bus boycott, and he was the principal organizer of the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice. A number of important organ Quaker organizations were formed in the 20th century, including the American Friends Service Committee, uh, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1947, I think it was. Um, Friends Committee on National Legislation, Friends Council on Education, a, a lot of the national organizations that, that we know now. And, you know, so now we're in the 21st century, and like I said, history has not stopped. Um, but I don't think we know yet what we will be known for. That is kind of our jobs. <laughs> and we'll figure it out as we go along. A um, few things I did want to mention. So the social movements in the United States that had strong Quaker presence um, were abolition, women's rights, prison reform, education, uh, mental health reform, Native American rights, and anti-war or peace movements. But we also made a lot of mistakes. Um, and some with the best intentions that had unintended consequences, some in retrospect just started off wrong and continued that way. So some of the initiatives the Quakers were also heavily involved with that, that I have some issues with. Um, the first is that it took 100, I mean, it took 100 years <laughs> for friends to actually accept that owning enslaved peoples was wrong. And even after the Society of Friends had taken that step, I think that a white supremacist mentality stuck with a lot of friends, um, that they did believe that no human being should be a slave, but they never 
fully accepted African Americans as their equal, their social equal. Um, there is a book that came out maybe eight years ago um, titled Fit for Freedom, Not for Friendship that talks about the barriers that white friends meetings set to um, welcoming and including people of color. And I believe some of those issues are still around today. Um, white privilege is real and those of us who are white um, carry those seeds with us. That has been true for a very long time. Um, the one of the Quaker uh, initiatives that I find the most disturbing was that Quakers were very involved in Indian boarding schools um, where Native American children were taken from their families, taken from their tribes, um, brought to the East Coast, put in boarding schools with the intent of making them Christian and uh, erasing quite quite deliberately and consciously erasing all traces of native culture and replacing it with Western European culture. Um, this was devastating to Native American communities and was often uh, very damaging and often fatal to those children themselves. Um, so the, the, the story of Indian boarding schools and the Quaker presence um, in, in that movement is truly shameful. Um, Quakers were also deeply involved in the temperance movement of the early 1900s, um, which led to prohibition. Um, that certainly in retrospect was rather misguided. Um, and I think also came largely from a position of social privilege and the othering of um, the, 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 the poor in particular. Um, and then finally, and this, this is one that is pure unintended consequences, but as part of prison reform, it was Quakers who invented and instituted solitary confinement. Um, and it was at the time seen as safer than being in a population of dangerous criminals, of felons, um, an opportunity for reflection, an opportunity to turn one's life around. It obviously ended up very badly. Um, solitary confinement is in many quarters today considered torture. Um, that, that comes out of Quaker reform. So, our history is mixed. There is much to be proud of. There's much to be inspired by. There's much to learn from. Um, as Steve Angel said in the video, um, there are also lessons to be learned about what we should not do. <laughs> and with any luck, we can avoid some of the mistakes that were made in the past.